game and is on the game's 100 best family list for that year. Um, and I'm kind of in the middle of shifting my business towards focusing on two-player games as uh, I talk to a lot of people who are part of couples say, I really wish there was just like a lot more two-player games that I could play with my partner. I'm like, that should, that should happen. And I would like to help with that. Uh, I'm Dan Kassar. Uh, I'm a game designer. Um, I made a couple games. One's called Cavemen, came out in 2012 from Rio Grande. Uh, one's called Arboretum, came out in, uh, this year from Z-Man. Um, and it has just been reprinted. So Ooh. please ask your friendly local game store uh, to get it because it needs to be out there. Um, he has a child who needs to go to college. I, I do, I do. So please, please, if you care about my child. <laughs> no. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, interestingly, uh, so my new game is called uh, Blood of an Englishman. It's about Jack and the Beanstalk, and I made that a two-player asymmetric game. Um, so I've been thinking an awful lot about how two-player games uh, work. Um, both of my other games also support two players, um, and Arboretum... Um, was based off of Lost Cities, which is an extremely popular two-player game. Um, and I took a two-player game and made it multiplayer, um, and so was encountering a lot of these issues of you know, the differences between uh, what a, how a game works with multiple players versus two players. So I feel like that's also relevant here. Um, and uh, yeah, that's who I am. Gil? Uh, my name's Gil Hova. I'm also a board game designer, and uh, I have three published games uh, with a fourth one on the way. Um, and uh, three of those four games support two players, uh, though they're not specifically two players. The fourth game is a party game that has a four, uh, two player mode as a variant. So it's a little, uh, it's, it's weird, but it's cool. Uh, and so uh, working on those games and making those two player versions really taught me a lot about how, to, uh, how a two player game works. Um, so, I'd just like to ask you all, the audience, like a couple of quick questions. Hi, audience. Hi, audience. Hello. You're all awesome, because you're yeah. here. Yeah. You'll all be awesome elsewhere, too, mm -hmm. but, but I can special. express that here. Especially. Um, who really likes two-player games specifically as a thing? I cool. Um, I kind of want to know what you like about them. That's a that's a hard question to ask in a panel, but uh, that turns things around a little bit. <laughs> but um, it's yeah. easy to find one person to play with. It's easy yeah. to find yeah, one person to play totally. with. Yeah, totally. That's, that's one of the biggest things I hear. Certainly, mm -hmm. as like mm -hmm. <laughs> they live in my house <laughs> and we'll play that game together. <laughs> it's awesome, and that's that's like I said, it's one of the big things that I hear from people, especially as I get older. Like four people. <gasps> right. Gil doesn't have that problem because he has like 16 people over a month. He has an <laughs> immense mailing list of people to game with. I feel like a two-player game you play it more often because it's so much easier to get mm -hmm. one other player. Mm -hmm. You might get double or triple the amount of plays than a four-player game. Yeah. game. Ghost Pirates got featured at one of my local gaming shops when they were doing the How About We website uh, support and it became a game for two people to play casually, you know, make friends, have coffee, hook up, whatever, you know, <laughs> uh, roll dice, kill each other. And, you know, so I've, I've got a lot of excitement about two-player games. And we had, we had a great time sort of like chatting about an outline for this. And Gil and Dan are like, okay, yeah, we've got this very kind of straightforward, you know, a lot of different opinions, but like mm -hmm. a pretty traditional board game. I'm like, two-player games, let's yeah. disrupt everything. <laughs> Um, and so we have a lot of different ideas, which mm -hmm. I think is awesome. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about um, going through our outlines. We have uh, a couple of big topics. Uh, one is marketing concerns, because we don't see a lot of them, and a lot of that is... A lot of two-player games. You don't two see player, a lot of two-player two games. Player games. Um, and I think that part of that is kind of a marketing concern, right? Two-player games are hard to demo, because you're only getting two people at a time. Ghost Pirates is a pain in the butt to demo because it's about a 30 minute game, 45 minutes if you're teaching it for the first time. And I've showed it to two people. Mm -hmm. 
as opposed to like a six player party game, boom, mm -hmm. <laughs> 10 minutes later, mm -hmm. I can take six more people, you know? Mm -hmm. So like that's, that's a thing that's hard mm -hmm. for, from a just getting uh, legwork done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, you know, I've spoken to um, you know, multiple publishers, um, you know, Stephen Bonacore is one that, that comes immediately to mind. Um, he doesn't like two player only games and it's understandable, it limits your audience, mm -hmm. right? If you're, I mean, like it or not, the board gaming audience tends to meet in gaming groups, right? And those are generally not two people. Um, sometimes they are, but uh, you know, uh, you know, if you have a gaming group, you have five, six people. Um, you know, the people are looking for something that supports as wide a range of player counts as possible. That just widens your market right there. If your game is, you know, any specific player count, if you have a three-player only game, a four-player only game your market immediately becomes very, very narrow because it's harder not only to sell, but then, you know, it's harder, if, even if you buy that game, you know, okay, who's gonna play this with me? You know, bridge, you need four people. Mm -hmm. and, you exactly. Know, ex you know, right, you need exactly four people. They all have to know how to play. If there's a difference in skill level, you know, it it's gonna to, show, yeah. yeah. Exactly, um, so uh, this is why I think mar marketers, you know, publishers have stayed away from two-player only games even though they are some of the, you know, some of the oldest, most traditional games that we have are all two-player games. Yep, yeah, and some publishers stay away from two-player games, and other publishers embrace them. So uh, if you're coming from the design point of view and you're looking to pitch games, it's really up to you to know which publishers like two-player games, which publishers will not touch a two-player game. Like, I was chatting with um, uh, Sebastian Pachon, who runs uh, Space Cowboys, and uh, he was amazed that some publishers don't want to touch two-player games. He's like, two-player games work great! I love two-player games! But he designed uh, Jaipur, which is uh, a really... Uh, it's a two-player game that sells really well. Uh, it's, it's an amazing two-player game, but it's uh, it really depends on the publisher. You know, obviously Cosmos had that uh, two-player box going for a while, the two-player uh, square box series, yep. uh, the one that produced Lost Cities and a bunch of other legendary two-player games. Uh, so it's really uh, there's the there's um, the uh, pub there's the publisher who did Star Realms and Epic. You know. Um, that, which are uh, mainly two-player games. I think you can technically p play Star Realms with more than two, but it's really meant to be a two-player game. Uh, and so there are publishers out there that will embrace two-player games. They're not as plentiful, but uh, they would be more passionate because the, the two-player movement, you know, people do like two-player games. They can just be a challenge depending on which publisher you're going to. Right, yeah. Everybody, every publisher has their own kind of preferences and they know that particularly audience there's a certain brand representation um, you know cosmos mm -hmm. it's like we have a mm -hmm. two-player series of games mm -hmm. like we are the two-player game company mm -hmm. um, questions yeah, I, yeah uh, let's, let's let's I want to make sure that like you, you'd say like magic players are a large like amount of money in this industry mm -hmm. that's a two-player game primarily mm -hmm. primarily so, like, yeah. obviously that's an audience that people can tap into with two-player mm -hmm. games yeah that is what uh, white wizard games I think that's the name of the I think that's the, that sounds yeah. like, yeah. That like sounds that's like. who they were going for, right? Mm -hmm. so like, and it's, I mean, it's, it's former magic important. players. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're magic yeah, players they're who wanted a game that wasn't yeah. magic. Star it's a, and, yeah, and, tough market to crack, though, because magic players, they really just want to play magic, and it's really tough to get magic. They'll play other stuff, but they want to play magic. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. Like, okay, yeah. let's yeah. hold them down. They, they, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Something else, I was but, just yeah. at the party where that happened. <laughs> yeah. The magic player was like, can we, does anybody want to play magic? <laughs> yeah. Like, no. And it's funny, you go, you, you go to a game convention with video game players, and like video game players will play anything. Like, they're like, oh, cool, a board game? Yeah, I'd love to play a board game. But, you know, the moment you get like a, go to a game store with a bunch of magic players, I'm like, oh, okay, my demos aren't happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's all about like what the audience is there for. Like, exactly. If there's yeah. a bunch of magic players, they can get their game in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Follow up to that. Do you think it's uh, about the scale of the game? Because, like, magic players are used to just cards and cards on a table, whereas, like, other people are more willing to accept a any scale game so like two player games can range between like a Tarji or Jaipur size box to a Space Hulk you know what I mean which is like the, the biggest two player game I can think of I think Magic players, number one, they're they're in the life they're what the, the lifestyle game, you know, and they really want to go see how deep the rabbit hole goes, you know, and they and it goes deep. Uh, yeah, and they they just want to be in that world, and you know, another game has to compare with that, you know, another game has to 
has to go against that. And that's that's really hard, you know, when it, you were so aligned to that one game, which is which is cool. I mean, I mean, it's cool that one game provides so much depth. So, should di- like, if you're designing a two-player game, should you aim to like touch those same dials, or do you want to like feed into things that aren't fulfilling the same things as magic for those people? I think that you can make that choice. Yes. Right. Yes. Because not everybody wants to play magic. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, that's the yeah. question. Like, right. what do you think is more successful? I, it, I, it, it depends on the audience because there's such if different we're audiences. At magic, magic is more successful. So, yeah. like, <laughs> in this spectrum. When you're marketing the, into that audience, though, like, do you, do you think it's uh, a better choice to design like a, a head-to-head card game to try to reel those people in, or do you want to like fulfill other parts of their? I game? think a head-to-head card game is fine. I think there's tons of head-to-head card games. I mean, a two-player yeah. game. Pretty much by definition is 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 going to be a head to and we're going to get to well, that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. going to be a topic. Uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's a thing. Um, but I mean, I think you will be more successful if you do not try to compete with Magic. Um, yes. You know, yeah. I just heard a stat recently that Magic is now currently the most profitable tabletop game uh, property in existence, bigger than Monopoly. Um, so if you just think about that for a but second, Monopoly has all those dollars. I, they do. They do. Um, <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> um, but there's no, no, if, there's no problem. Yeah, there. there's no problem there. Uh, not a lot of, you know, the pink money. Not, the, the, doesn't it's, it's not real money. Does it? <laughs> you know that, Tim, don't you? Uh, so, yeah, so I wouldn't try to compete with it. I mean, um, but there, there is, you know, there is an audience outside that. And, you know, Magic players, uh, I think, as mm-hmm. Gil said it best, they want to play Magic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, I think... Naively, when I was first starting to create games, I was like, you know, because I'm a former Magic player, and I think a lot of us probably in this room um, have at least played some Magic. I was like, oh, you know, card combos. If I have card combos, you know, Magic players will like it. No, they 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 really don't. Um, mm-hmm. You know, because it's not it's not Magic, and mm-hmm. it's just that simple. Mm-hmm. And it might be an uncanny valley thing, also, where the closer you get to Magic, right. the less they like it. You know, <laughs> is that uh, why you think Dominion was successful because it's so different, but it still has card combos. Uh, I don't. I think it was successful, but, player, but 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 I don't think it necessarily tapped into the magic. Really? Uh, oh, okay. I, it, a little bit, yeah. I mean, it did, but I don't think that was exclusive to its success, though. Yeah, I think there I was think... like there. There's a complementary skill set like mm-hmm. that that hits both magic and dominion in terms of the card comboing. Mm-hmm. But like dominion marketing is targeted at board gamers, yeah. right? And so you get I like how you point it to me. <laughs> board gamers. Well, you're, you're my go-to it's, it's example for board Gil. gamers. Yeah. It's targeted at Gil. Yeah. Um, you have a lot of boxes of Dominion on your shelf. I do. You do. That, that is you true. know how many I have? Wow. Um, <laughs> and you're proud of that. He is. I, I'm fine. You know. I didn't like Dominion that much. Um, yeah, but like I think the marketing is targeted differently, and so while there's like relevant skills that cross over, uh, you know, where magic players can find a lot of enjoyment in Dominion, it's not necessarily going to. Oh, I'm I'm giving up magic for Dominion, <laughs> right? Because Dominion is not always changing. Uh, you learn combos and different sets of combos, but it's comparatively static, and like. You're building a different deck each time, so like unless you're like a magic drafter, you know, explicitly, which most there are magic, people like that. There are player people like that, yeah, and that's like the only way I'll play magic anymore. Right. Um, like I don't have any time or dollars for a constructed deck. Mm-hmm. Maybe get this: Do you start off with a two player or try to press down to a two player? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I. Pitfalls, though. I. I for 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 my dollars, like I will try to design a two player game. Like um, when I when I want a two player game, I will design a two player game. Um, if I want a bigger game, I'll aim at that bigger game, kind of knowing maybe this could work. But you know, sort of like kind of knowing when to sort of like up that lower lower limit. Um, well, I think that actually segues nicely into. Uh, one of our next points, which is why would you create a two-player game in the first place? Um, I think there are lots of ways to get at it. Um, I think certain games only want to work as two players um, and or, or work best as two players. Um, other games, you know, are kind of, you know, could work both ways, um, and there might be many different ways, uh, you know, you could approach it. Um, so, for example, uh, my game, Blood of an Englishman, which is uh, being playtested right after this panel, if you're interested, <laughs> uh, is uh, about Jack and the Beanstalk. It's an asymmetrical game where one, play, one player plays the giant and the other plays Jack. 
I can't see a good way to do that multiplayer. Um, mm -hmm. That is just a two-player game, and there's just mm -hmm. really no other way to do it. Um, so for thematic reasons, that's not going to have a multiplayer mode. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, many other games, you know, like, um, you know, take, take a fighting game, a uh, video game, you know, like Street Fighter or something mm -hmm. like this. That's probably not going to work nearly the same way um, in a multi. I mean, I could envision maybe what it might look like as a multiplayer game, but it would be a very, very different game. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that game wants to be two players. So those are, those are you know, there, are, there could be thematic or mechanical reasons uh, why you might want to make a two-player game. Yeah, yeah and I th so Jeff Engelstein has a great point uh, that he brings up when he discusses two-player games, uh, and it goes into uh, actually um, astronomy and physics. Uh, so uh, astronomers can predict um, the orbit of or the path of two celestial bodies uh, and how they relate to each other as long as it's two celestial bodies. The moment there's a third celestial body involved, you can't use a single equation anymore. You gotta like brute force it, you gotta put in all these estimations. It becomes incredibly complex and mathematically chaotic once that third body's body enters. And it's called the three body problem. And uh, that's what we're up against the moment we take a two player game and turn it into a three player game. All of these complexities start sneaking in uh, and it's just, it's a mathematical and thing. Unpredictability. Exactly, chaos, unpredictability, all these things that we can't expect, uh, when, whereas when you have a two-player game, uh, there's much more um, elegance and simplicity uh, with the relationships of the two players. Yeah, I think that like kind of shows uh, in 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 something like a worker placement game, where like if that they do, I I can pick two things that I'd like to do, and if somebody goes there, my opponent goes there, I can go to this other one, and vice versa. But the moment it's like three or four people, you're like. Please don't pick that. Please don't pick yeah. that. Please don't pick that. Go! Yeah. <laughs> okay, now my turn's going to take a while. <laughs> exactly. And uh, like how auction games uh, don't work with two players either because right. they thrive off of that interaction. And uh, if you have only two players, there just isn't enough to make that auction juicy. Well, I will, I will kind of jump in there. Uh, my, my first game, Caveman, was an auction game, and mm -hmm. um, I feel like the auction there worked okay um, for two players. And the reason why... Um, was because it, it, it's very different. A yeah. two-player auction does work, but it's it's really just it's it becomes kind of a push your luck mechanic, mm -hmm. um, right? Because you you know you have a resource, and I go okay, I'll go two, you go three, I go mm -hmm. four, and then you start going okay, is four worth it? Is five worth it? You know, mm -hmm. and then you you know it's uh, so now it's a it's a brinksmanship kind mm -hmm. of a kind of mechanic as opposed to okay, let me see what everyone else does, feel it out. I mean, it feels mm -hmm. very different. Auction mechanics can work with two players, but they just feel incredibly different. And I think it's because of exactly this mm -hmm. dynamic you're talking about. You have a, you know, is it a two player like okay, um, you know, you go then I go then you go, you know, and and there it makes sense to just escalate by one at a time, in most cases, not always. Mm -hmm. Um uh but in with a with the third actor now you've got much more chaos because you've got way more uncertainty because what what player uh, player two does uh, player three does could depend on what player two does so you cannot predict uh, right. ahead of time how that's going to play out and so when when Gil mentioned this in our kind of pre pre panel conversations this got me thinking about so if if like three or more player games are reliant on that chaos and two player games to use the analogy, are kind of solved. What makes two-player games good, right? If 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 we're kind of sticking to the analogy, they're easy to solve, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But chess is not easy to solve. Go is not easy to solve. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of spectacular games out there that mm -hmm. are not solvable, and uh, that got me thinking. Like, what what makes those good? And um, one of the things that I was thinking about is like, like what what keeps that dynamism for a two-player game where you don't have the added chaos of two extra players? And one one of the things that I think is is deep complexity and strategy. Mm -hmm. And I think chess and go fit that uh, to a T, yeah, beautifully. You know, like these are these are games that have stuck around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And you know, if two-player games were strictly solvable and bad, that would not have happened. Um, the other thing that I think makes uh, two-player games really interesting is that it matters who you're playing with, right? Like, if I'm playing a game with Dan versus playing a game with Gil, <laughs> they're gonna be very different games. Um, and so there's a, a social interaction, uh, there is a 
a, a habit of how another person plays mm -hmm. and how you can adjust your own play to, to meet that, to match that. Mm -hmm. um, it might affect your habit to take risks. Um, yeah. You know, there's, I, there's lots of interesting things that I think are not necessarily yet explored, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, I think that you know, what you're touching on there is, is uh, an important point, that two-player games are especially good at setting up tests of skill. Um, where you and another player um, have equal footing and are going head to head and competing over one particular set of problems, um, and there might be some back and forth, but you know eventually one person is going to prevail, um, which is why I think two players are a two player game uh, in 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 the best case should be something pretty different from a three player game. Mm -hmm. I feel like a three player game wants to kind of provide. Um, a wide range of opportunities for people to kind of you know explore and and compete in different arenas on different vectors, whereas um, a two player game can be much more single dimensional and you you 're just saying okay here 's our tug of war here 's our test of skill, and this is why I think it lends it so, itself so well to that relationship that you 're talking about where I'm going to play against my wife, and we're going to we're going to go head to head, and we're you know sometimes I'm going to beat her, she's sometimes going to beat me, and we enjoy, but yet we enjoy you know doing that and testing each other uh, repeatedly, and the best games allow you to do that and grow together. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, uh, and uh, a two-player game is also not going to have uh, that uh, social balance uh, element that a lot of multiplayer games have, especially if you've got direct interaction. So once you have direct interaction in a game for three or more players, you know, you've got the old don't hit me, hit him, he's the threat thing, um, you know, that metagaming thing. Uh, whereas in a two-player game, it's zero-sum, so you're going to hit. You're going to hit that player. There's no Don't room. hit me, hit yourself. Yeah, There's exactly. No yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> You know, it's uh, so you're the threat. Yeah, so oh, um, because when once you have that in a multiplayer game, you've got uh, a multi a multi level equation. You're you're figuring out um, who you're hitting. You're figuring out what you're going to hit them with, and um, and because of that, it's uh, it, it's kind of a tougher question to ask. Like, do I hit? Tim or do I hit Dan with my attack? Well, what situation is Dan in? What situation is Tim in? Can Dan defend my attack? Can Tim defend my attack? And, you know, you're uh, balancing all these equations against each other. Um, and um, whereas if there's an action in a three-player game that you can do to just give yourself points, that's going to be better than the attack because you are you're benefit yourself uh, to both of their detriment. Whereas if you're attacking them, uh, you're only really going to be moving them down a peg unless the game has some special mechanisms to boost you up. But nevertheless, there's still, like, you're going to hit one player more. All that is not existence in a two-player game. In a two-player game, everything that hurts you helps me. And that's just the nature of zero sum. So uh, because of that, uh, it's more likely for a two-player game to feature that direct interaction because uh, it's much cleaner. It's much neater. You lose that social... Um, Unpleasantness is the word that I'm going to use, although some games, uh, that unpleasantness is a feature, not a bug. Now, one of the things that, like, Dan immediately touched on, or Dan, mm -hmm. not you. The other Dan. Actually, yeah. both of you. <laughs> you both kind of talked about this, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, boom, let's both talk about zero-sum games. Mm -hmm. I'm like, let's talk about what we could do with two-player mm -hmm. games, um, where it's not one versus the other. What about a co-op two-player game? Oh, I would love to see more co-op co two-player games. Uh, that two-player... I've, I've, got, I've got plans. <laughs> the, the I've two, got plans. The two-player variant of Bad Medicine that I have is actually a co-op two-player variant, you know, which is... Yeah. It's, it's a, really a uh, design space that I think could be explored more, and the market is huge for that. Right. That's I, a fantastic market. I think, I think like, the, the asymmetric is a really nice way to get away from, like, the strict... It's not strictly zero-sum, because it's a little bit weird. It twists things a lot, like... I think Netrunner is a fantastic game, yeah. um, and you play very, very different games depending mm -hmm. on which uh, side you're playing, the runner or the corp. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, one person wins and one person loses, but you also play another set of games where you're playing your corp deck and you're mm -hmm. playing your runner deck, and you get a lot of, uh, you get a lot more complexity, even if it's a, okay, I'm attacking you, you're attacking me. 
if you have units that the other player doesn't have, I mean currencies that the other player ha doesn't have, then any action you do in that currency, it's going to be difficult to evaluate how that affects them right. and how it works in relation to yeah. them, which is one of the appeals of Netrunner. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think everybody knows what we mean by zero sum, right? Meaning that, like, you know, each it's it's the tug of war mechanic, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, minus one plus one that makes zero. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and I think this is why you know um, the the zero sum nature of a of a two two player game makes it especially sensitive to balance issues. Um, you know, that's something where you know you have to be extremely. Um, you know, this is why I think most of your traditional uh, two player two player games are abstracts and perfectly mm -hmm. symmetrical um, because that's the only way you can be absolutely sure that both sides are perfectly balanced. Um, you know, in a, in, if we're going to play checkers, I have just as many checkers as you do. Um, you know, but a kind of a knock-on effect of that, though, is now if you have this perfectly symmetrical, uh, perfectly symmetrical two-player game, it's zero sum. Well, now something that becomes extremely important is who goes first. Mm -hmm. They set the tempo of the entire game, and this is something that you know is mitigated heavily in in a, in a multiplayer game, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if there's four players, yeah, I went first, but. It, it probably isn't going to throw things off that it might a little bit you know depending on the the way the mechanics work but in chess everybody knows you know black is on the defense the entire game mm -hmm. and this is something that you know two player games especially have to really think about um you know very very hard um and it's something i thought about a lot with my games and one one of the one of the interesting sort of kind of interesting uh, effects in there is like for different skill levels go has a a written-in handicap mechanism. Mm -hmm. Like you get pieces on the board if mm -hmm. you are the weaker player, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the the difference in skill level, the bigger it gets, the more pieces you get on the board, which gives you a, a certain amount of advantage. Yep. And there's a chess variant where uh, I mean, there's tons of chess variants, <laughs> of course. But uh, one popular handicap is that one player starts with fewer pieces on the board. Right. You know, and yeah. pieces are assigned points, and yep. you can play to a different point value. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Any other questions? yeah, does anybody have questions Comments? right now before we go on to the next section? Thoughts? Two player games? I feel like a lot of the challenges in publishing two player games relate to marketing them for their appropriate context. What thoughts do you guys have about placing a two player game as a product opposed to as a game? Yeah, uh, you want to take this or shall I? Uh, so, so, a handful of things. Um, the, the big thing that I think is important about two-player games in terms of retailers is like get the retailers to understand uh, that this is a game. This is a game that's for two players. It is a game like Ghost Pirates is is a awesome couples game. It's light. It's easy. It's made for that. Like there's dice rolling. It doesn't require heavy strategic thinking. Like it's it's designed to be very tactical play. Um, and it's succeeded greatly at my local shop. Like, they sell more of it than anybody else. Um, they also know exactly how to sell it, mm -hmm. right? Like, they know this is a two-player game, you want a couples game, that one, mm -hmm. right? They can go immediately to that game uh, and they know that it's there. Um, as a product, I think that that has to be a, a super explicit thing. Um, yeah, one thing, uh, if I could just jump, yeah, yeah, in, jump in, jump in. Um, is that um, I think Cosmos did this actually very well with some of their games. Um, they have a game called uh, Caesar and Cleopatra, which if you haven't played, is fun. The what, um, Cleopatra? Caesar and Cleopatra. Oh, Caesar and Cleopatra. Not Caesar yeah. and Cleopatra, which is what I heard. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, Caesar and Cleopatra, I think, you know, on the box, you've got a man's face and a woman's face, you know, kind of facing one another. It's very clear what that game is. Heron you know, and Zeus. Yeah, yeah. Heron and Zeus is another, another mm -hmm. great example of that where you see, you know, uh, it, there's literally a couple on the box oh, facing off each couple, other. Hetero couple, but oh, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is one sort of couple on that box uh, facing one another, um, and um, you know I think that that was a good move uh, because it allows you to say, hey, you know, here's a game that we might like. You know, oh, I can be it's, Zeus. You know what I mean? Subtle branding, but yeah. like where Kahuna doesn't have that, for example, right. and it's way less obvious that that's a two-player game. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I think we've already identified two possible, uh, two big audiences 
for uh, for two player games, and one is couples, of course. Uh, but the other big audience, as Jeff was talking about, are magic players. The 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 occasional magic player who is looking for something between rounds of magic, you know, something to break up the flow. And I think those are two pretty big markets for two player games. Uh, the approach is going to be wildly different, you know, the product, the, the what they're going to look like as a product. Because you look at like the Cosmos two player games, you know, those are in the distinctive square box, but those are made to um, look distinct on a retailer's shelf. Whereas uh, any game that's going to go up against Magic, that's going to be as in a small a form factor as possible, you know, designed to just be tossed into a bag, uh, you know, so it'll... See Star Realms. Yeah, exactly. Star Realms, Epic, you know, all, 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 all both of those games. Um, those are all going to... Uh, be uh, approached a different way because they're going to be approached with uh, someone who's used to playing on a mat. You know, maybe they got their own roll-up mat as well to play with that. Uh, so it's a different mindset based on uh, who you're aiming for. And we've talked about Star Realms a little bit, and I mm -hmm. want to just kind of bounce this off of you guys. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen a kind of growing number of two-player games that are modular. They're their mm -hmm. own expansion. So Star Realms, you add mm -hmm. another deck, you get. Mm -hmm. two more players you get another deck you get two more players uh, deck building the deck mm -hmm. building game mm -hmm. is its own expansion two more players two more players mm -hmm. two more players thoughts um I I mean um in a game like Star Realms, I mean, I know Dominion had a thing where they, I know it's not a two-player thing, but uh, player counts are so sensitive, you know? Uh, there are these breakpoints, and we've identified one breakpoint between two and three with a three-body problem. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, I think, another breakpoint between four and five. You know, you see a lot of four-player games, but you don't see a lot of five-player games because there's just this extra bit of player control and agency that you lose when the fifth player comes in. Some some games can survive it, and uh, most games don't. And uh, so I worry that, like, uh, what you, you st when you start putting in these packs, that you just start going over breakpoints. I know I don't think Dominion survived the five-player breakpoint. I don't think it works well as a five-player game. You just you, you, it's like you play something and just you wait, you wait to get attacked because every extra player is a new opportunity to get witched. You know. Sure. So, uh, so it so it really depends. Uh, it, it depends on the game. Uh, some games might be able to survive it, uh, but two-player games are designed with so much interaction in mind that if you're just adding players, you're you've got so much interaction going on in the system. I would system. say unless they're designed without interaction in mind, and the, ah, the yes. one that really comes to mind is um, Race for the Galaxy. Yes, uh, I mean it's got interaction, but it's an interaction that's very sustainable the interaction across a lot of where you kind of glance. No, up and... no, no, no. <laughs> I'm I'm a def I, sort of interaction. I gave <laughs> I gave I, guess that matters. I gave some podcasters a really hard time about this. Yeah, I mean, look, there's the there's a bunch of different kinds of interaction. You know, there's a bunch of different ways to interact, <laughs> and parasitic interaction is one way. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, I, I mean the appeal of Race for the Galaxy is is building your tableau, and right. yes, it's a sandbox. You know, you're building your own. I don't want to call it a sandbox. You're building your own solitaire. area. It's not no, no, no. Solitaire. I like it too. I like it too. Game. But once it you get that, game. once you I don't get like it, but it's a great game. Once you get the hang of it, you know, you're, no. Once you, <laughs> once you get the hang of it, you're going to really have to uh, have to see what actions you can piggyback off. You know, right. you can get a lot of short, and you're going to be a lot better. But the difference is the difference is. Uh, the last panel I did, I was talking about zero-level heuristics. Uh, when you're just starting a game, the, the rules of thumb that you adopt and Race for the Galaxy, the zero-level heuristics are all fairly solitaire-ish. You, know? you are playing multiplayer solitaire when you play Race for the Galaxy for the first time because there's not enough space in, uh, in your brain for, uh, to accommodate for the, uh, no matter who you are. Uh, to, to count icons. for the other. Yeah, there's, exactly. There, well, there's there's a lot of icons. There's a lot there's a lot to pick up. It's it is it is a lot to pick up. Well, I know? think Race for the Galaxy is actually a really interesting example because I think it touches on some of the things we were talking about. Because um, Race for the Galaxy, I think, does fine as a two player game mm -hmm. because of the kind of uh, the nature of the interaction mm -hmm. interaction mm -hmm. yeah. in that game. No, uh, no, it is it's an interactive game, you know, but it's really really passive. Um, you know, I am a big Race for the Galaxy fan and, and really enjoy the game, but it's you know it's not competitive in the way. Um, you know, a more head-to-head -head style game. Would yeah, be. you're not. You, you can't attack someone. Now, if you want to talk multiplayer solitaire, let's t let's bring in a multiplayer, a genuinely multiplayer solitaire game. Have you played Take It Easy? I 
have not. Okay. Really Take it easy is uh, you. So there's a lot of games that are based on this mechanism, but the idea is you've got this uh, met that has all of these hex spaces, and everybody has identical hexes that show these three tube lines and these three lines, um, and they're all different colors. One player shuffles up all of their hexes draws one and everybody else draws the matching one and everybody places it on their mat. Then the same player draws another one and everybody places. It's a fantastic game, but there is zero interaction. I mean, there's literally zero, it is zero, <laughs> literally multiplayer solitaire. So it plays exactly the same with two as it does with a hundred. And when I say a hundred, I mean there have been conventions where they tell people, bring your copy of Take It Easy, we're gonna play a hundred player Take It Easy. And it's, it's, it's great, but you know, it gets away with it because it is a 15 minute game. You know, you don't want a one hour game where there is literally zero interaction. And I'm using literally because to Race for the Galaxy does not have literally zero interaction. There is parasitic and there is minimal interaction. There isn't a lot of interaction, but the but there is interaction and that's why I really feel the need to distinguish it. I think another and we're gonna bring this back into two player games, I swear. But, <laughs> but uh, the, the I, but I poked him. The it's, inter my, it's my fault. But the int yeah, the, the interaction <laughs> but interaction is a really important thing with two player games and I think it's important to study how interaction works in other games so we can bring it back to two player games. Let's look at another case study for Notre Dame. Notre Dame is another game that is uh, plays really well from two to five because it has minimal interaction. All you're doing is you're drafting, you're passing cards uh, to the left and there's a little bit of interaction with the carriage pieces and that's it. So it plays really well with two, plays really well with five and it scales that way because the interaction is very minimal. So the less interaction there is, the better the game's going to scale as a general rule of thumb. And I think that gets back to your point, actually, because you were talking about, do I start from a two-player game, or do I start from a multiplayer game and start to pare down to two? Well, I think that really depends on the nature of your mechanics. If you have this kind of parasitic or passive interaction, I think you'll be fine doing two or doing five. Um, but if you have this kind of head-to-head -head kind of uh, setup, I think making that work as a, Make, you know, yeah, as a multiplayer changing game... Changing the number of players starts mattering a whole, a whole lot, lot more. Yes. Well, and this is one of the dynamics that we, you know, had... Um, um, you know, had kind of touched on but hadn't directly addressed is that, um, you know, this social balance mechanism that, that we were talking about, um, you know, with the Kingmaker effect as well being yes, you know, a, big, a, big factor, yeah. a big factor in there. Uh, if you're not familiar with the king, term Kingmaker, the idea is that, you know, okay, I can't win, but I get to decide who of these other two players win. Yes, if I can focus my attacks. Exactly. Yes, or, if I attack player B, player C wins. If I attack player C, player B wins. On my turn, I only have the choice between attacking player B or C. I have literally no other choice. So who's going to win? It's entirely up to me. Who do I like better? Who bought me dinner, you know? Yeah. And that's Kingmaker, who's, and it's not who's fun. Promise to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and nobody likes that. And but the, I think that's an inherent problem with direct, uh, direct interact, directly interactive multiplayer games. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very hard to get away from. And I think this is why Euro games, um, you know, have shied away from that direct interaction because this is how you mitigate that effect. It's one of the reasons. Yeah. Yeah, one of mm -hmm. one of the reasons, absolutely. And so, um, you know, but this, you know, this whole, um, you know, getting back to the zero sum versus multi, you know, versus non-zero sum games. Um, I, I think that you know, in a multiplayer game, uh, there's often a choice of you know, okay, do I strengthen myself? Do I weaken him? Do I weaken myself? There's always this this balancing act you've got to do between okay, mm -hmm. you know, um, am I you know who am I who am I helping? Who am I hurting? Yep. And you know, um, you never have that choice in a two-player game, so it's a it's a lot simpler, and you eliminate a lot of these you know kind of uh, diplomatic issues, um, diplomacy issues in the, in, in the game. We've so, been talking no, really fast. We have. Yes, we have. <laughs> Another question for you guys. Back yeah. to marketing. Take any Agricola two-player game versus the Agricola full, uh, full game. If the full game wasn't there and you start off the two-player, would it have been as successful? I don't think it would have. You know, uh, I think uh, the core of the Agricola full game, I think uh, while a lot of the worker placement and har harvest mechanisms are really good, I think what pulled a lot of people in were the cards and all, all of... And the extra replayability that the cards gave you, like, oh, this game, I'm going to be able to do this that thing that I never got to do before. Uh, so the play space was just enormous. Um, the, uh, or at least it was big at first. I think a lot of people felt that once they played a few times, it wasn't as big as it seemed at first. But still, I think it's big enough that it was notable and it really made an impact. And I think that's one reason why it was so, success so successful. I don't think... Th I think the two-player game, All Creatures Great and Small, is a good game. Um, I don't think it has... It had that impact on the market that Agricola did. So I think it's just... It's part of Agricola's wake. Agricola I, yeah, left a very big wake. I think that 
there are a lot of games that come out uh, and they occur to me as afterthoughts that are trying to capitalize on a thing that was a success. And that's kind of where, that's, that's yeah, where it strikes it, me. You yeah, know, it, what, uh, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, no, it does. And I think another thing it does is it helps Agricola. Because when you buy the full game, because when you buy all creatures or you see all creatures great and uh, all great and small, that reminds you of Agricola. It reminds you of the base game, and it keeps the base right. game fresh, even though it technically doesn't involve the original game in anything other than like sharing a few rules. Right, it's just a reminder mm -hmm. that something else is out there. I mean, I asked that question more of back to you know, can you market successfully a mm -hmm. two-player game? And I'm just going through my mind. Top twenty games in BGG. Only one I can think of right off the top is Twilight Struggle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's definitely a two player, long two hour, three hour shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but when you start going down the list, you're like, oh boy, it gets really thin. As only two players. Well, right. I, I think a lot of BGGers, and this gets to like the bias of the BGG rankings. The BGG rankings are fascinating, yeah. but they are biased, and you have to know their bias. And yeah, part of their not. bias is for longer, heavier games that have a big space to explore. Mm -hmm. um, and the scores are six to seven. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how statistics yeah. works. <laughs> so uh, that's the that's this uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. Um, uh, but I think. Uh, it's good. This is, I mean, Netrunner, I think, is probably on there by now, right? Uh, Netrunner's probably? It's in the top 100. That's, I'm, I'm just, I'm it like, is, literally it's got to be in the top 100. Top 100. It, it, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if it's in the top 20, but I'm pretty sure it's in the top 100. But, uh, you know, we've discussed two games out of 100, yeah. and I think it's an interesting choice uh, why uh, two player games uh, tend to not be. Uh, well, okay, that, I, I, I need to take a step back. War games, you know, old older war games, the old school war games, right. a lot of those were two players. Right. And some of those were like you set them up uh, in May in your parents' basement uh, with your friends from high school, and you played three hours uh, every week, and yeah. then sometime in October the game finished, you know? Right. Uh, so, you know, those games the certainly... jumped on it, you started yeah. over. Exactly. You know, those games had an enormous scope. Uh, but nowadays you don't see two-player games with such a huge scope, and I wonder whether that is. X-Wing, kind of X, X yeah. X-Wing is an awesome one, and but like that one's again sort of like in that miniature space mm -hmm. where it mm -hmm. kind of capitalizes on like like you were saying the heuristics of like here's a war game. Mm -hmm. Also, you can play R two D two, yeah, or like Tie Fighters, and that's awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this gets back to the point that you had brought up, Tim, uh, about you know. Uh, in a two-player game, how does one provide that variation, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think actually games like you know Twilight Struggle with just a very big game space, right? right? Or this game like X Wing, where you have tons of different units, or or Magic, and it matters who you're playing. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, you right? know. Um, I'm gonna lose to my friend Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think you know the you know Magic provides you that huge metagame, and X Wing also you know you have the huge metagame to explore, um, and so you can play with the same person over and over. But this time I'm going to play this. Mm -hmm. This time I'm going to play you know something mm -hmm. else, and so you can it's constantly new. And I think the war game is the same kind of thing, just in a different arena, right? Mm -hmm. You know, okay, we're going to play this thing for six months. You know, mm -hmm. and wow, you know, and even if you lose, it doesn't really matter, right? You mm -hmm. went through this epic uh, thing. I mean, that's one way of of providing that variation in a two player game. The other way is what Tim brought up, which is this just infinite depth, right? Where you have a chess or a go, mm -hmm. where it's just, okay, right. it's just so complex and so not solvable that you can just play it and play it and never get tired of it. Yeah. Uh, I've got a thought. So why do you folks think uh, the two-player games, uh, we don't see so many two-player games with that sort of twilight struggle depth, at least? Because the market is perceived as smaller. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the they're harder to demo. That's that's the yeah, biggest, absolutely, absolutely the biggest I issue can't, that I find. I can't imagine demoing Twilight a, a two-hour oh, two-player game. That yeah. is a hard There's, game. There to goes demo. two hours, right? yep. and I exposed it to two players. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe one. I think. I mean, I think a game. <laughs> I think a game like Twilight Struggle. I mean, I mean, as a designer, as a, as a business decision, making a game like Twilight Struggle is just a bad idea. I mean, you know, it's a bad investment, it's right? I mean, enormous risk. It's it's know? a big risk. I mean, it, that's a GMT game. I'm pretty sure. GMT, I think so. Yeah, yes. GMT is. Uh, but that uh, GMT is the perfect publisher for it because they do tons of two player games for people who like that kind of crunchy and depth. So they were. I can't think of any other publisher that that game would suit. You know. Yeah. Um, so for them, it was. 
was a good business decision, but they're probably the only publisher but, but who they, are in a position they, to do but that. But they know explicitly that that is their audience. Exactly. And probably exactly. had that audience intact already. Yeah, yeah. Know, absolutely. Like, yes. I mean, for a new designer, for a new game, yep. for a new, you know, I think, yeah, I mean. Yeah, Dan just started doing that. Yeah, you know, just like, yeah. Noted by that. that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me challenge you on something. Mm, are, were there more two-player games back then? Because, like, I was going through, like, Make Him President was out there. There was the, uh, the one. Yeah, like, yeah, so is there a situation where we see this, like, nice peak? Of two player games made building from the GMTs and it all of a sudden. Was it 1960 the same player. designers actually? Uh, it's the same mm -hmm. system. I think it's one of the same designers, yeah, right? I mean, and then you got like uh, uh, the, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, the Richard Bird games. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Command and Conquer yeah. series. It's, it's right. Yeah. Conversion games too, like yeah. up front, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, would, well, I would guess, and I don't, I'm, I'm going to guess. Yeah. Uh, that the, that the, the space in which two player games play is different. Over this time, right? Mm -hmm. There has been like a huge growth of you know the multiplayer games uh, as board gaming has grown in popularity over the last twenty years. Of you know, I identify it as starting with Catan. I I'm not a game historian, but that's where I saw it because that's where I got involved. Mm -hmm. My friend brought it back from Germany, mm -hmm. and I started playing board games, and my mm -hmm. world opened mm -hmm. up, right? Um, and over time. That war game space that used to be really big, coming off of you know World War II historian, World War One historian, Korean, Vietnam, mm -hmm. like that space started shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of like two player games kept going. Yeah. Like, and I go out and I keep finding two player games. I, yeah. I've, I've been looking for them yeah. at this point. I'm like, oh. And this is a two-player. Oh, this is a two-player, yeah. and I'd, I'd never looked at it before. And right? to add to that point also, um, uh, the, the, the games that you mentioned, there are really two lines of games, right? One line is the Command and Colors games. So, you know, you got uh, Battle Cry, you got Memoir 44, you've got Battle Lore, uh, all those games. Those are really one line of games. And then another line, you've got Twilight Struggle, you've got 1960, uh, you've got any other game in that line. So that's pretty much two families of games. And so I think any sort of peak and value see related to those uh, are just traceable to a single line. It's not like there's um, a different group of games uh, that were inspired by it. So, you know, those are, so, so it's, it's kind of tough. Um, right. like something, I, sorry. No, uh, yeah, I was going to say, like, there's not a whole lot of branching off of those. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, you get your smatterings of like, oh, we ended up with this game that's two players. Great. Yep. Or your Cosmos, and we're like, let's let's do this and have a brand. Mm -hmm. um, There's one more kind of two-player game. There's one more family of two-player games that we haven't mentioned that I think we should. Um, that's you know we should. Uh, uh, I, I started by thinking of the Chris Brum, Chris, Chris Brum game, Chris Brum or Chris Brum, uh, like Zertz, Yinch, oh. Gif, the Gif games, you know, uh, those are all two-player abstracts, and that lets uh, that leads to the question of the curse of the poor two-player abstract fan, you know, um, you know, but, uh, poor two -player yeah, yeah, you know, somebody comes to a game group and they have a two-player abstract, oh. and you have to tell them. We're not playing that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, well, sorry, it's, man. It, we got it's, four it's, players. We got four players. <laughs> And there's just no room. For and it. even if you do, you know, they're like, well, what publishers can I show this to? And you're like, <laughs> you know, publishers just don't go for two player abstracts, you know? Yeah, I mean, we. Reiner I mean, Knizia has seen some success. Well, he's Reiner Knizia. Yeah, his, na his name can sell that game, you know? Yeah. Uh, and also, a lot of his, uh, t his quote unquote two player abstracts have a thin theme, other than like Ingenious. But again, that's, that that's a four player. Example. That's a four player <laughs> game, too. Uh, it's uh, the other version of Ingenious, which yeah, is two player. Travel. There's a travel version, yes, but you know it's it, it's it, it needed ingenious. Eddie, you had a question. Uh, yeah, would you would you say um, is it, seem, it almost seems to me that uh, public perception of two player games, uh, and I'm talking about like maybe sort of uh, mainstream mass market, uh, the idea of what a two player game should be feels like it was heavily influenced by the arrival of Magic. Like once Magic hit the scene, it seemed like you're either doing this as a two-player game, or you're not at all, or you're failing. Well, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'd 100% agree with that. I mean, I, I think, I think, uh, I, I think I would agree with that, in, uh, but uh, in a slightly different way. That to say, magic in general affected gaming in an enormous way. Yeah, you don't, I'd agree with that. You know, yes. um, I, I, I think magic. I mean, you could, you could easily say that. You know, I mean, you don't become the most profitable uh, uh, gaming property in in all of uh, in the world without 
really impacting the way games are made. Mm-hmm. Um, you That'd know, be really weird if you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, right, yeah. It's super the, successful, the ultimate, but nobody else wants to do that. The ultimate right? sleeper you know? yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, um, it seems like if you try to do that, you're, you're basically flying too close to the sun. Yeah, yeah in a way. I mean, it's you know, over and over. Right. Yeah. The video game space, so mm-hmm. the WoW killer, it doesn't mm-hmm. exist. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, yeah. people have tried and, mm-hmm. you know, fail again and again. I mean, so you're just, you're not going to make another CCG. You're not going to make an MMO. You're just not. And it's right. it's because and, you have that 500 pound gorilla still sitting there. Right. Mm-hmm. And so there are variants in anal, like, there are, there are variants on that theme. Like, uh, Android Netrunner used to be a CCG called Netrunner, which I played the hell out of. Mm-hmm. And which I loved great. that game. Yeah, it was oh, awesome. Awesome. Which is why I still love Netrunner, because yes. it's the same game. Yep, basically. Um, and the way, and, and it didn't do great, like, because it was up against magic, and you had to be a huge cyberpunk nerd in the 90s, like me. <laughs> um, <laughs> stop laughing. <laughs> you were too. <laughs> um, uh, and, and then you played a lot of that game. And I didn't play, I played comparatively little magic. I played some magic, but I played a lot of different CCGs, and I was really into that. Um, but Netrunner scratched a different itch, but it also didn't succeed in the same way magic did and so they came back 10 years later and iterated on that and said okay we're making this standalone game that is the same game that was awesome and successful not as successful but now we can be a very very different kind of thing Mm -hmm. we can sell $12 packs Mm -hmm. and you don't have to keep buying those Mm -hmm. but everybody needs each one Mm -hmm. if they want to be Competitive. It's not even competitive because people have different play styles. Because because you want to see yeah, it's com- completionist. I think is a better word mm-hmm. for it because completionist is hitting a lot of game space right now. It's like mm-hmm. collect them all, mm-hmm. get a hundred percent, get you know this set of achievements. Mm-hmm. You know, Lord knows I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too. Until I stop and say, what am I doing? Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, do we quickly want to go through our experiences with our own games? Uh, We've got like five minutes. Sure. Sure. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, uh, my game, uh, Blood of an Englishman, testing right after this, uh, is uh, an <laughs> asymmetrical two-player game. Um, and I ran into a lot of these same things that we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I find asymmetry extremely hard to balance. Um, you know, Everybody I does. I have said, uh, you know, uh, it's, you know... And and this is a game that um, plays in a, a, a feels very abstract. It, I, it has very very simple mechanics, and yet I've been at it for two and a half years, um, and have still can't get it balanced. <laughs> and you know, uh, and it's just because they just work differently. And you know, um, uh, and I'm I'm going for something that's extremely you know stripped down. And so uh, obviously I can't. You know, it's easy if you kind of layer on a lot of mechanics, you can you can kind of get there more easily. Um, I found that uh, I still find this very challenging. Um, but one thing I will say is it just the the amount of uh, the dynamics it creates are just really rewarding. This is why I'm I'm still at it. It's because um, the ability to say, oh, okay, I'll play Jack this time, or you know, you know, I want to try the giant. You know, it gives you um, it, it it gives you some of that metagame variation that we were talking about, and that's really what I'm after. Um, you know, my other specific two-player uh, ex- experience was with my first game, which is an auction game with drafting mechanics. Both drafting and auctions uh, tend to be kind of more multiplayer-centered mm-hmm. things, um, but I found that um, you know uh, they were very interesting in a two-player sense too. And if you haven't tried that, it's 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 kind of cool because um, you know it's kind of like picking you know drafting becomes almost like picking two teams for 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 kickball. You know, yep. like right, you know, all right, I get this one, you get that one, you know, this mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, and the auction becomes this brinksmanship thing. So I think those are two interesting things you can uh, you can look at for your own two-player two game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Ghost Pirates was a game I designed for play with my wife, very specifically, mm-hmm. and um, it's got uh, a lot of luck and sort of identical starting point setup, but dynamic boards as the the game goes over time, and then dice rolls to really keep it a little bit wild and fresh and have some surprises every once in a while. 
and it was pretty successful. Yeah, it seems very successful, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, for me, I um, my main experience has been adapting my multiplayer games to two-player, and my most recent one, The Networks. Um, I remember testing a two-player version of it with a friend, um, and his, the word he used to describe <laughs> it was uh, boring. Uh, actually, he had a word in front of boring uh, that I won't mention. Uh, so I realized I needed to do something to sort of put in uh, and I found that a lot of two-player games do need uh, some, a lot of uh, two-player adaptations of multiplayer games do need some sort of extra mechanism just to sort of uh, m uh, re restore the, because a lot, of, my game is a drafting game, as, as we talked about, chaos, the, those drafting games need that chaos, that extra three-body chaos, that chaos from the third body, and that just wasn't happening with two players, just I take something, you take something, I take something, you take something, and there was just no dynamics in it, so I introduced a mechanism that every three turns, um, we uh, you'd lose some cards from the display, uh, and that really helped things. Like originally, it was um, like I was think I was originally going to do it like every two turns. Like I take a card, you take a card, something goes away. I take a card, you take a card, something goes away. But that's not a good cadence because um, I'm always the one who gets first pick after a card goes away, and that's not as much fun. And it's something I got from actually uh, San Juan. Uh, which is another Euro that plays well with two, but it has this thing where the first player passes every three turns. So I take a turn, you take a turn, I take a turn, and then the start player tile passes, and that gives the start player some powers. And it's such a good, equitable way to to do things. It's just this every three turns instead of every two turns. It's a real pain in the tuchus to you know to to audit, and you have to put some special mechanisms in there. But it's really it's really useful. Yeah, I was going to actually mention that my game broke it up with, with a change in turn order as well. There was yeah. an option for turn order. So mm -hmm. I think that's key if you're, if you're in a two-player scenario where you have that mm -hmm. change in turn order is vital. Yeah, really. We can do a last question if anybody has something, but I think we're otherwise. Yeah, Jeff? Yeah, what's your favorite two-player games? Lost, si Lost, Lost Cities, Cities is my... Go. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two votes for Lost Cities. Goes amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, someone asked something? Oh. Two player only, you're saying? Yeah, two player only. Uh, for me, it's it's Lost City. So yes. I will throw a shout out oh. to Ascension also. Even though Ascension's not technically a two player game, um, I think it plays best with two I players. I play a ton of it on my phone, yep. two player, mm -hmm. and it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I've played like a hundred games. What's your play favorite? Um, barring games you've designed. Sure. What's your favorite two player game? Go. 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 What's That's your favorite two player game on a date? Honestly, Ghost Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> Fight! You forgot the qualifier. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.